Let's reflect on our course materials on ritual and emotion to see what insights might be gleaned from them. We might start by noting that there is always a connection between rituals and the emotional experiences of the participants, but the connection might take one of several forms. There isn't necessarily a simple, direct correspondence between the emotions displayed in a ritual and the longer-lasting moods of the ritual participants. First of all, rituals are routine and structured events in which the roles are often predetermined, and so it is easy to imagine that the outward expression might not be the same as the internal emotional experience of the participants. Consider, for example, some church services. If the congregation sings a joyful praise song or a hymn of sorrowful repentance, that does not mean that all who sing at those times feel, fully feel, or feel only the joy or the sorrow about which they are singing. On the other hand, our course materials show that there may be a unique connection between the everyday emotional experiences in a culture and common rituals within it, even though the authors show that connection may be quite different. Let's review our course materials and think about what conclusions we might make through their comparison. All three of our sources have some bearing on Branislaw Malinowski's so-called uncertainty hypothesis. Malinowski proposed that people are more likely to use ritual magic in situations that are risky and unpredictable, where uncertainty is high. Malinowski proposed this theory after he saw that Trobriand Islanders used more magic when setting out on open seas fishing expeditions, which are characterized by risk and wherein yields are unpredictable. He noted that, in contrast, they did not use ritual magic when fishing in lagoons, which is not risky and where yields are predictably reliable. Although the episode A Good Birth in the television limited series Medieval Lives does not explicitly mention Malinowski's uncertainty hypothesis, it seems implied. We see that during the medieval period in England, prior to the advent of modern medicine, birth was fraught with risk, both for the child and the mother. Rates of miscarriage, stillbirth, infant mortality, death, and maternal mortality were high. In these situations of uncertainty and risk, ritual magic abounded. People felt that the pain and suffering of childbirth were punishment inflicted by God on women because of Eve's original sin. Consequently, childbirth was surrounded by shame as well as danger. Women sought the aid and relief of the saints, notably St. Thomas Becket and St. Margaret. Birthing chambers were filled with holy relics, and childbirth was accompanied by chanting of prayers and the use of magical charms such as parchment amulets and girdles and holy water. A successful birth was often followed up by a pilgrimage to the saint's shrine to give thanks. The episode explores the deep irony that accompanied King Henry VIII's reformation of the church. On the one hand, his move to break away from the church in Rome and declare himself the head of the Church of England was motivated by the anxiety around childbirth, as his wife was unable to produce a surviving son and he wanted to divorce her so that he could remarry and produce an heir to the throne. On the other hand, the Reformation ended up heightening the anxiety around childbirth for all English women. The holy saints' relics were destroyed and women were instructed to pray directly to God, not the saints. Birthing rooms were stripped of magic that helped women cope with the risks and uncertainty of childbirth. Our second source engages directly with Malinowski's uncertainty hypothesis. Richard Sosis and W. Penn Handwerker analyze whether reciting psalms reduced anxiety levels for Jewish women in Israel during the 2006 Lebanon War. The researchers wondered whether religious action can relieve all kinds of anxieties in all kinds of situations. 
They tested Malinowski's hypothesis by examining levels of stress among two different groups of women from the northern town of Tzvat, those who remained in Tzvat and who were therefore worried about a Hezbollah rocket hitting their houses, and those who relocated to central Israel during the war and faced logistical stresses related to relocation, including sleeping in tight quarters, not having access to their belongings, and worrying about how to keep their children occupied. The first group met Malinowski's criterion of living in risky and unpredictable conditions. The second group faced anxiety, but their stresses were things that they could address through instrumental pragmatic actions, not only through ritual magic. In accordance with Malinowski's theory, those who faced risk and unpredictability experienced a reduction in anxiety if they recited psalms whereas those whose stressors could be relieved by instrumental action didn't experience the reduction in stress. This is an important piece of research because it shows that ritual action doesn't always relieve anxiety, but does so best in situations of risk and uncertainty where non-ritual, instrumental means of reducing risk are unavailable. Finally, moving on to Fiji, our third source doesn't mention Malinowski's work explicitly, but the relevance is clear. In this case, the Fijian chain prayers, ironically, intensify the sense of risk and anxiety. British missionaries introduced Methodist Christianity to Fiji in the 19th century, and today a variety of Christian denominations are found in Fiji although the Christian practices are inflected with Fijian cultural concepts and phrases. One of the most significant cultural changes introduced through British colonialism was the demonization of the ancestors. In pre-colonial Fiji, the ancestors were the benevolent spirits of the deceased who watched over and protected their descendants. The missionaries, however, introduced the notion that the ancestral spirits were really demons who would, if angered, send curses, which would be manifest in, as he says on page 8, quote, sickness, poverty, lack of education, difficulty getting married or having children, and general failure to prosper, end quote. In addition to demonizing the ancestors, British colonialism also upended Fijian culture by replacing the chiefdoms with the national government. As Tomlinson notes, in Fiji today, there is a general sense of powerlessness, a feeling that in the past, people, ancestors, leaders, families, and land claims were all stronger. Now, hazards from the past, powerful, malevolent, ancestral demons, are believed to loom over and threaten the safety and prosperity of people who perceive themselves to be powerless. Tomlinson notes that the rise of chain prayers in which people gather together to ask for God's help in lifting ancestral curses are symptomatic of the generalized sense of powerlessness. Although the chain prayers offer a bit of psychic relief at the time, by invoking a menacing presence from the past and appealing to an almighty God, the chain prayers perpetuate the sense of human weakness and fearfulness, ironically ensuring the need for more chain prayers in the future. One chain prayer, as given on page 12, illustrates the pervasive sense of dependency. Quote, Please make the words of the prayers already offered efficacious. Please receive this offering of soil, a symbol of the ancestors. It is with their spirits, their hopes of the chief's family, and their belief that these things are possible for you, God. We hope this illness will be healed, however long the binding. Yes, we depend on you, God. Please be so kind. Please receive it. Please touch it. Please breathe on it. Please eradicate this illness at its root. So its strength is finished today. End quote. Tomlinson adds that the ambiguity of the phrase, this illness, is particularly ominous. It can refer simultaneously 
to ancestors, demons, sickness, and you. The ambiguity of the phrase heightens the sense of fear and the sense that hazards from the past threaten the present in multiple and unexpected ways. In his words on page 13, quote, the threats engaged that night will undoubtedly reappear in Tavukian discourse, identifying the dangers in society and locating their sources for ambiguous dangers once invoked may slip out of people's control, end quote. He concludes on page 13, quote, ritual participants create and perpetuate the sense of a dangerous past that is never finished. This tension gives ritual performances such as chain prayers a palliative role in the present, but also conjures up the shadows plaguing powerless humans with present-day misfortunes, end quote. To tie Tomlinson's article back to our larger discussion of ritual and emotions, we might conclude that the chain prayers give direct expression to emotions felt by the participants, in this case, anxiety, fear, and dread, in the hopes of gaining God's intervention and relief. However, by hearkening back to the notion that malevolent ancestors threatened the Fijians, and by reaffirming the notion that people are reliant upon an omnipotent God, the participants in the chain prayers may unwittingly be assuring that a generalized sense of dread will continue into the future, necessitating more chain prayers. In this sense, then, the rituals are both a direct expression of felt emotions, but also ensure that other emotions will be stirred up in the future. If we put together the two articles and the television episode, we might conclude that while rituals can often relieve anxiety, this isn't always the case. Sosis and Handwerker's article shows us that reciting psalms relieves anxiety when there are no instrumental, pragmatic, means to relieve the stressor, but they do not relieve anxiety when there are other instrumental means of action. Tomlinson's article shows us that even when people think that the ritual might relieve anxiety, if the ritual reinforces a sense of helplessness, a generalized anxiety persists over time.